So I'm really happy to see everybody here. This is kind of a new concept that we have. And since we've been doing the event space, a number of you guys have been doing really good work. And you're also smart because you're taking advantage of the website. And what I mean by that, is, by the website, by the event space, you know, let's take for instance, we've got, we got Norm here in the back and Norm loves photography. He sees a lot of things with Soho Photo. But there's some amazing speakers come through the event space, some really good events. And we do do this all for you guys. Uh, Deborah and Shoshana in the back, we try to always creatively come up with new events, new things to help you guys out. And you know, we also, there's a lot of events that we don't do. A lot of manufacturers, they just want to come in here and show off something. And if they don't wrap it with a good presentation and a good, a good real photographer who's using it, we're not interested in having them come in. So we do curate the events quite a bit. So over the years, I've been seeing a lot of you guys who are talented coming in here, learning a lot, and then doing something with it. So uh, what I've done is uh, curated this, and uh, I'm asking photographers, so you, you may get asked um, if we're familiar with your work to come here and, and show work. And if you wanted to show off your work, you can always email us as well. But uh, you know, we've sort of gotten to know a few of you guys quite well over the years. So it's a, it's a pleasure to have you uh, come here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a, uh, a short introduction um, a little half-hour slideshow from each of the uh, the three photographers that were chosen for this inaugural opening photographer showcase series, and then uh, they're going to show some work. And uh, in the end, you may hear some some music, like in the Oscars when they've talked and shown too much photography. <laughs> but uh, so we'll see how this goes. And uh, just want to just kind of let you guys know that we also looked at another portfolio this morning, and uh, you know it feels so good to see you guys creating good work. It's wonderful that yes, we do get a paycheck from B&H, but being able to, to showcase your work, it's an honor and a privilege. <laughs> and I'd like to start this off with Charles Chesler, a, a local New York photographer. Thank you, Charles. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. To give you a little two minutes about how I started. I started in 2005. Uh, my father had been in and out of the hospital at Mount Sinai for uh, four <coughs> major surgeries in a two-year period. My wife and I were living on the Upper West Side, uh, and it was quite stressful. To, so to keep sane, I started walking back and forth across the park every day at all hours, all through the seasons. And I started carrying a camera, um, and it helped me to get my attention out of myself and what was going on and outside of me uh, and onto something more interesting uh, at the time. Um, and feel connected to what was around me and present in the moment. Um, this harkens back to, I, David had written in the, uh, on the website, I started out life as an actor. It stopped being fun for me, so I stopped. Uh, and the thing about photography to this day, going back to 2005, is I love every second of it. Um, I'm working on various different projects. I'm interested in shooting a lot of different things. You're going to see stuff. I spent a lot of time. I love Central Park because that's where I can be. So I'm going to do some Central Park, some flora in Central Park. I'm very big on the birding, big in the birding community, involved with a place called the Wild Bird Fund. And then I'm going to show some people stuff, which I started to do a couple of years ago. Uh, and then about a year and a half ago, I embraced the iPhone, which I think is an absolutely uh, wonderful tool. So I shoot with everything. I shoot with a full frame DSLR, I shoot with an iPhone, some of the older photos, and I use even today uh, some old point and shoots. Sony had some great my models called the V3 and the R1. Um, so with no further ado, I guess I'm going to start uh, going through. Um, so this is indeed Central Park. The band shell is just off to the left. Um, what I love about this was with the Sony R1 is the wonderful saturated colors uh, that come after the rain. Um, one of the great things about the park. Uh, this is off of Bow Bridge, uh, and I call this Swan Lake. Um, this was also uh, with a, a Sony with this R1, which was an all-in-one wonderful little camera. Not very fast, but amazing image quality. Uh, this is at the reservoir and, you know, waiting as a photographer is something that I love to do. Uh, and uh, these, two, uh, these two geese came into the perfect spot, the juxtaposition um, with the towers on the upper right. Uh, I play around with all different kinds of processing. I live in Lightroom. I adjust every image, some things I do very little to. This has a little bit of split toning to it. Sometimes I'll drag in a vignette. Um, the other software that I use is on one software, and I use them to up-res photos. I use their perfect resize, and I use their perfect portrait to work on portraits. 
later I will get, uh, I'm pretty much amazed, I've blown up iPhone photos, uh, and at the end, after everybody's done, if anybody wants to see, I have a 15 by 20 metal print of a photo I took on the iPhone from a moving train uh, of five points. I got very lucky in the capture that I got, but with upresing software, I think the sky is the limit for that sort of thing. Um, so continuing through Central Park, so this is with my first DSLR. It's a Canon 50D, which I still use for birding, waiting for the 7D Mark II to come out. Uh, and my first and favorite DSLR lens, which is a 70 to 200, the F4. Image quality is great. This is zoomed in from the Bethesda Fountain across to this area, which is called the oven, uh, because in the middle uh, of the summer, it's as hot as an oven in there. Uh, for any of you who are into birding, just on the other side, deep in there, uh, in the ramble where all the birds might wonderful for birding uh, in the spring and the fall especially. Um, but also in the winter, we have a lot of year-round residents. Uh, currently, there is an oriole pair, a Baltimore oriole male and female, that are beautiful that have been at the feeders. And I think I have a shot of the uh, male just from a week or two ago. Uh, this is kind of a signature shot for me. I have it on cards and on my banner. Uh, what I love about this uh, technique that I'm sure many of you use is to pick a frame and in a town like New York to wait for life to move through it and to try to organize the chaos into something <laughs> that works. And for me it works, it's evocative somehow. Um, I probably took about 20 or 30 images before my fingers started to go numb. Uh, this is also the, uh, the 50D with a 70 to 200, so a bit of reach compressing the space. Uh, but what makes the image for me is the gesture of the guy over here. Oopsie, wrong one. <laughs> so this fellow right here, he's kind of just with his hands in his pockets, and this image worked more than every other one because of that for me. Um, black and white, so simple movement in the grace of the trees and the white of the snow. Everybody shoots the bow bridge. I'm no exception. <laughs> uh, I love being out in the snow. Uh, this is the base of uh, thank you, Wagner Cove. And this was uh, maybe a year and a half or two years ago. And I'd never seen it before, and I've never seen it since like that. Uh, it was both cloudy, and there was a mist that had dropped into the cove. Um, I think this was a 24 to 105. I was zoomed in a little bit. And I probably increased the saturation a little bit. I'll go either way with stuff. I'll increase or decrease clarity. Uh, I'm a little bit whimsical that way. It's kind of what I like to do. Uh, I know some people have a very specific style, but I enjoy the process even in the moment on the computer, figuring out what I want to do. I'm not, there's some photographers who pre-visualize a lot and they plan or they do big fashion stuff. I'm not that guy, I'm reacting to the world around me. Um, and I love doing that because it keeps me present. Uh, this is Bethesda Terrace. Uh, it's a spot actually where I do a lot of portrait work. You'll always see wedding photographers there. Uh, and it took me a few years to figure out how I wanted to take this photo. Um, and I think actually it looks a lot better on these screens over here. But it's backlit and I wanted to have just enough of the shadows so that you could see detail. Um, and I, I sepia toned it because I thought it was effective. So. Um, so this is another view of Wagner Cove. This is from about a year ago. Um, this is a full frame camera with a 16 to 35. Uh, I shoot Canon. I think all cameras are great. I started with Canon because ergonomically, I put my hands on everything when I got my first DSLR in uh, 2008. It fit right and the menu made sense to me. So I've stuck with it and keeping on building up on that system. Uh, at the end of the day, you just have to go out and shoot, right? You know. So this was also last winter. If you tip the camera to the right, it's going to end up being a little. T I did that for a little dynamic push there. Uh, this guy, we chatted a little bit, and then he walked away. Uh, and his jacket, you know, in the snow with the blue sky, bam. Um, I'm not adverse to. I probably increase the red or the orange channel to add a little saturation to the jacket. I'll do that, you know, salt and pepper to taste, whatever you like to do. Um, this I took just this past November 2nd. 
uh, which was my birthday, and I remember, and I thought, what would I like to do more than anything else? I hadn't been out much shooting, and I was walking through the park shooting, and it was kind of the peak of the fall foliage. Um, what was great about this moment for me is that there are a few things going on. If you take them away, you realize, ah, it wouldn't be happening. Uh, so one was the peak of the foliage. Two was a calm lake, so there was a pretty perfect reflection. And the third was a little bit of clouds to add interest in the sky. Uh, the bonus was this guy who was fishing, and he was there for about 10 minutes and barely moved. Um, and I had a nice opportunity to get a, a great exposure. And you know, moving a little to the left, a little to the right, a little up, a little down, I moved just enough. You'll see his head is kind of between the two buildings there. I did that on purpose. I don't always have the presence of mind for that, but as photographers, you'll, I'm sure, appreciate that. Um, by the way, this photo is uh, currently, are you all familiar with the B&H uh, Safari competition? Mm -hmm. So out of over 35,000 entries, this photo is in third place. I need about 500 votes to, <laughs> <laughs> to win. If any of you are willing to go vote and share, uh, this would literally be a dream come true for my wife and I, not something we'd be able to do, but to go to Namibia to win the People's Choice vote. So please go vote. <laughs> go to Namibia anyway. Go, well, I will, but we're going to have to win the lottery to do that. Okay. So. <laughs> Um, uh, so onto the flowers, I put a few flowers in. Uh, so connectedness for me can be with the environment, uh, with the landscape, or just with something that's beautiful. Uh, this happened to be, we were in Montreal a number of years ago. And for me, this is about perspective, getting close, getting low, moving down, moving up, just to fill the frame the way you want to. I cropped in a little bit after uh, the fact on this. I didn't frame it perfectly. Um, there's some people who are great at that and they frame absolutely brilliantly in camera. I'm in process with that, uh, with a lot of things still with photography. I think I feel my, uh, like I'm an intuitive photographer for certain things, um, but I have to work on it. But the thing is I love working on it, so I'm doing it. Um, so more flowers, so a backlit tulip. This is all out, this is in Central Park. The rest of these will be in the park. Uh, filling the frame, getting the textures. I might, you know, when it's, when you have a bright object and it's fairly dark around the object, you bring in the blacks and it makes those go even darker. Uh, so I look for those kind of moments and opportunities. Um, this little bud, uh, this is uh, on a beautiful tree right near the Delacorte Theater focused on the bud. Um, this was probably with the 70 to 200, zoomed all the way in, shot wide open. That's grass. Uh, I don't think I upped the saturation on that, but that was a lesson for, if I had moved a half an inch this way, there would have been gravel or stuff in it. So in framing and taking your time, isolating your subject um, and shooting wide open and zoomed in for some nice bokeh. So this is in the Bethesda Fountain, and this dragonfly behaved for me. Um, this was a crop of a shot. This is another uh, example, though, of using something like On One uh, Perfect Resize. I've blown this up to kind of, uh, I think, two feet by two feet or three feet by three feet on canvas for somebody. And after up it, it holds up really, really well. Person was happy. This is probably my favorite ever uh, flower photo I've taken. It's the backlit white tulip. Uh, and it was pretty dark all the way around. I didn't select a mask or anything. I didn't draw anything in on that. Uh, and I just brought the rest of the blacks in enough so I could leave that hint of the uh, stem, uh, which I quite liked. This happens to look amazing in a big metal print, by the way. And if I can, any of you who are shooting, if you've never tried metal, uh, I really encourage you to print on it. I poo pooed it at the beginning, and then I tried one, and they're really quite beautiful. It gives a look uh, that you really can't find any other way. Um, and as I said, I have a metal print. If anybody wants to see after the whole presentation, all three of us. Uh, this is a little series I'm working on of isolating, and I will select and darken around and uh, some suspended flowers, things like that. I will over sharpen. I will add clarity for effect. Uh, it's a look that I like, not for everybody, but I like it. Uh, and then who doesn't like a nice bee on a flower, on a 
cone flower. That was Washington Square Park. I was down looking for uh, hawks that day, uh, and they weren't around. So this was on a tripod uh, can with a 50D, a crop uh, sensor, and a 400 millimeter, and that's the whole frame because I had time to pull back and just really blurs out that background very nicely. Okay, so now we're into New York City. Um, and the nature of other work that I do, I help older folks exercise. That's my foundation, how I pay my rent. And it gives me the freedom to shoot how I want to um, so, because I want photography to continue to be fun for me and slowly sort of build the business. And that gives me the opportunity to do that uh, and time on my way to and fro. This is taken with a V3. It's an old Sony 7 megapixel camera. Uh, it was shot with a JPEG. I split toned it and dragged in a little bit of a vignette. And I think I even added noise on top of what was there for a look that I liked. Uh, so Rockefeller Center. Uh, this was uh, one night I was walking home. You know, the power of photography to take you to a place. I had a, a wonderful client. I was with her for the last, uh, as a trainer, five years of her life. So I was walking home after she had been ill and she died a couple of months after that. So I'll never forget, I walked across town and I took this with a little SD990 that I had, a Canon point and shoot and I propped myself and I took a bunch of shots and I made sure to expose for the uh, value of the lights that were on the, uh, on the building which were very close to those beautiful lights that were, uh, that were on the tree. And I've blown this up to 16 by 24 on metal and uh, up resing it and it holds up beautifully. Um, this is another example. So this Sony V3, I shot at very high ISO, and I lost detail because when I got rid of the noise, I didn't want it in this, but I don't mind. For me, this is evocative. It takes me back to a time uh, when my wife and I were living uptown on 181st Street. Um, moments. So this was with uh, Canon 50D. So. 50 millimeter 1.8, the $100 lens. It doesn't matter. Sometimes it does matter, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, um, I'm very interested in people in, in populations uh, that are invisible, uh, that people don't pay attention to, that we take uh, for granted. Um, so you'll see a little bit more in my street in New York work about that, and that's a project in process that will be a long-term process. This was up at 181st Street, and this is the best thing about the whole time we lived there. <laughs> this, is with this, uh, this is with this V3, 7 megapixel old Sony point and shoot. That's built like a tank, by the way, uh, which I'll never ever get rid of. And waiting in the snow, and I wanted to get the snow in the bridge, and this gal, thank you, walked, and she hung out with her dog in the snow for about two minutes. Uh, this is going up the uh, escalator. This is with a wide of 12 to 24. So I'm pointing straight ahead, and he's over here, but that wide angle lens is taking him in. Um, so there's a little distortion, but I, I kind of don't care. <laughs> so, um, and this again, and this is more in the city about taking your space, whether it's in a crowded area like Times Square or out of platform, and I'm just holding up and as things are happening, uh, grabbing a snap. This really does look much better on these screens yeah. here. Um, and I'm hoping to capture something that's evocative of the city and our rhythm and people and what they're going through on a daily basis. That's my goal with this work. I love this guy. Uh, and I'd just been standing there and he stared right at the camera as he walked by and bam, I got him. And here I was doing the reflection of the uh, flag that's in Times Square. I was playing with the door revolving and this fellow just stopped and looked right at me and I wanted to, I want to go find him and give him the, but I also in uh, shooting people, especially people I don't know, I'm also working on something called Agreeable Strangers. There's a guy who's got a lock on the big thing with that already. <laughs> but I've been doing this for a little myself. Um, I like direct engagement. There are brilliant street photographers who are catching moments with people unawares, and I love seeing that. I'm just drawn to interacting with people. Um, and I do like the idea of trading information and closing the circle by sending them a file or a print. Uh, I feel like they're giving me something. I want to give something back. And, we're all in this together, most of us. 
Um, so here's an example. Uh, this was taken from NYU. I had access because I went to see the great Len Spire. There was a show of his work uh, up on whatever floor it was. I never would have had access. So I had my iPhone. So this is an iPhone shot which I pulled in and generally uh, you'll see the iPhone shots. I'm kind of uh, whimsical and I'll just slap a filter on it on the phone. I'll talk about what, what app I use, but I brought this into Lightroom and processed and I added noise. And I've printed this up 15 by 20 and it looks fabulous, up resing it. So the Brooklyn Bridge, how do you get uh, an original shot of the Brooklyn Bridge? So I was out with some good friends shooting. Brian was with us that day. Um, and this, I sat low with my wide angle lens and waiting for life to move through. In an ideal world, the people way back down in the middle would not have been there, but I felt this gal come by me and I cropped in a touch so to get her in the spot that I wanted. Um, and I went, and you know, it looks better here. I went with sepia tone because there were a lot of competing uh, colors I thought that were detracting. This was about the lines and the composition um, and the feel of moving up into this beautiful, beautiful old structure. Um, and this gal who looks like it had been rainy and cloudy, who's intrepid New Yorker on her bike. <laughs> this is on, on the High Line. I was walking by and this gal had made herself at home very well dressed. Um, I post a lot of work on Facebook, for better or for worse. I like to have my work out there and I, there's nice interaction with folks. Uh, and this, I was surprised, this image is most popular with women. Um, I, so, for what it's worth. <laughs> This is one of my favorite shots. This is out our, we live on the 10th floor on 62nd and West End. And we used to have a view and they're building, they're constructing. Um, so Alicia, my wife says, look out the window. These guys are rigging the crane. This is one of these huge cranes. They're dragging a cable. So they're about a block away. Um, so I grabbed my 50D and my 400 millimeter. I have the 5.6. Uh, which so I can handhold it. I can't really handhold anything bigger generally for the birds. This is a little bit cropped in for effect and I was shooting. I was waiting for them to get between the two buildings. I had a little presence of mind and I was hoping there would have been some gesture, some motion and, uh, and I got it. Um, so there's that. And this is just having fun. This is the lights of Columbus Circle. Uh, this is a full frame. This is 16 millimeters, shot at about a sixth of a second, ISO 3200. And I like the movement and the feeling of it. So there. <laughs> um, so the birds. Uh, I do a lot of bird photography. Been at it for about five or six years. I'm happy to say that I'm in this month's Audubon magazine, published for the first time. It was very exciting for me. Thank you. This wonderful place, the Wild Bird Fund, which is our major bird rehabilitation facility in the city, uh, they opened about a year and a half ago, so I donate a lot of time to them. And I covered an, an event where these monks were coming to bless the release of birds back into the wild. Audubon did not send their photographer, so they ended up using a few of my photos. It was a very nice opportunity. Um, so, you know, what's not to like about a sparrow who's giving you the eye? The light was beautiful. I don't think I dragged in a vignette at all on that. Um, so getting a little personality. I'm going to run through the birds fairly quickly because I had a hard time whittling down. Uh, just to show the variety. If you've never been birding in the park, folks, the ramble in the spring and the fall, it's breathtaking breathtaking. Buy a cheap pair of binoculars, go. It's one of the great resources that we have in the city. Um, and I've decided that I'd be, I'm dedicating the rest of my life to getting good bird photos and hopefully doing a book at some point. So this is some great light on a December. Bird with the berry. I tend to shoot wide open, burst rate, uh, my center point spot focus. If I have enough light, I'll stop down a little for a little bit more depth of field, but that's, that's about it. If I can move the focus point because the bird's in a certain area, I do that. But I will get the center uh, focus point and then I will crop for effect because that's how I like to roll. <laughs> Northern flicker, double crested cormorant uh, drawing. For those of you who don't know, they do that not to show off, but they're the only bird without oil glands. Uh, so after they dive for food, that's how they have to dry their wings. And it's beautiful to see. Look at that one. <laughs> uh, downy woodpecker. 
So this is a scarlet tanager that was released back into the wild. This was a few years ago, and I got very lucky. This is where I met the gal who runs the Wild Bird Fund. Um, and I'm just going to give them a little plug. Uh, they're on between 87th and 88th and Columbus Avenue. They rely on volunteers and donations. If anybody's interested in getting involved with them, feel free to shoot me an email. CharlesChesslerPhotography.com, you can get me that way. Or Charles Chesler Photography, you can get me on my Facebook page. Come and like me, hang out. We have a nice dialogue, a whole bunch of people on there. Um, so this guy flew when they released him, landed right into this lovely kiss of light, and I got lucky and I grabbed focus, a couple of clicks, and got him. So female northern cardinal, I love them. I think they're more beautiful than the males that are all red. There's a subtlety to the color and the beak and all that. So it was a really nice neutral background there. And again, I'm shooting wide open for that shallow, shallow depth of field. I call this my Apollo Anton Ono speed skating duck. Yeah. I was on the uh, reservoir uh, at, at uh, one, I don't know, it was a year and a half ago or so. So it was a sheet of ice and it was hysterical and I felt the ducks were sliding all over the place. So being ready and hanging out and being ready to focus, this duck slid right into this shaft of light with its reflection. Boom, 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 three shots. One of them was in focus. That's how that happened. <coughs> Um, this is full frame, got very close, the black capped chickadees. Uh, Kurt, you were with me at that, in those times. Um, and these guys will come into your hand and eat out of your hand. They're amazing and it's a beautiful feeling uh, if you've never experienced it. And this is right in Central Park uh, in the Ramble. Uh, this is, you know, black capped chickadee pull-ups, I call this, working out. So if you can get behavior, really, really lucky. So, and I don't mind, there are people who won't, uh, put up photos because there's sticks coming out a little bit. You know, what are you going to do? He's doing pull-ups. This is one of my favorite uh, shots. Uh, only time or one of two times I've seen this is a northern parala. These are the kind of birds that you can see during migration. Uh, this bird was flitting around and he was at the bottom of this stem here uh, and he was climbing up. So this was a case of pre-focusing on the top and hoping that he would get there. And he got there and it was boom, 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 gone. And I got him, I was thrilled about that. Uh, and this is also cropped in a bit, but holds up in printing with up resing quite nicely. Uh, this is a gray cat bird and a nice kiss of light, natural available light. This is Riverside Park. Um, unfortunately, this baby hawk did not survive, uh, but the juvenile, the red-tailed hawk population is increasing in the city. It's a beautiful thing to see. 10 minutes, thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, this was astounding because he was eating food. I didn't have to travel to Namibia for this, and he would grab something, rip it, and he would squawk, and you, I felt it in my body. It was an incredible moment to be around. All right, so I'm gonna kind of go through, this is a white-breasted nuthatch, uh, that's a house finch, that is a song sparrow, hello, uh, another downy woodpecker, uh, black-crowned night heron, all in the city, folks. This is at Washington Square Park, I got close, that's the full frame. Um, this is a red belly woodpecker in the snow. This was a year ago, January. I'd been waiting and waiting to get a bird in against the white snow. Quick story about this, always shoot raw. I didn't have enough time to adjust. The light is very dynamic and changing. He came down. I had to recover about a stop of light, but it holds up beautifully. It was underexposed because of the white, all of that. Uh, this is a week or two ago. This is the male uh, Baltimore Oriole, also doing a little side pull-ups and eating. Beautiful to see, takes your breath away. This is a dark-eyed junco. There's a great rock around the feeders in the ramble, and it's a great place to shoot because you get that nice gray in front and behind is so far behind that you get total blur. Uh, this is a down, another downy woodpecker on a stick. This was a week or two ago. And these finches are deciding what's for dinner. <laughs> So that's the end of the birds. I'm gonna fly through. So, so people, I wanna connect with people. This was in Italy. We had a chance to go in 2008. Uh, this guy is a master craftsman. It was in Volterra. This was literally, we're outside blazing hot. I raised my camera and I went like this and he said, and he went back to work and I feel like this is the kind of person who knows exactly who he is. And I find that very, very attractive. 
Um, so this is my friend Halima Henderson, a wonderful <laughs> actress. This is done uh, at the Bethesda Fountain nearby. You can see the reflector. Light's coming from the back. We're bouncing a little light back in. That's her tough law and order shot. This young gal was at the end of a shoot. Um, I look in shoots, I really want people to drop in. I want something authentic. Uh, there was uh, no reflector, there was no flash. This was an open shade under the highway down in Riverside Park in about uh, 68th Street or so. She finally gave over and just dropped in for me in this moment. Um, this is at the Mermaid Parade. I like to shoot the people on the side of the parade as well. I asked this guy if I could shoot him. He was very nice. He said, you want to shoot me? I said, yeah, I really, really do. Um, there was a lot of light bouncing around, really beautiful. I probably lifted the shadows. This is where I had the presence of mind to move myself just a little so his head was right between the, mid uh, the windows there. That doesn't always happen for me. I love this guy. I think he's beautiful. Um, so this is, there's a ton at the Mermaid Parade. So what I liked about this was, of course, the guy kind of <laughs> checking back, uh, aside from the great makeup. Uh, and this was an officer towards the end of the route. Uh, and I love this. She was also, why do you, you want a photo? I said, yes, please. Just look at me, would you? So I had two shots. I had to lift the shadows a little bit here. I don't always get it right when it's happening that quickly, but why not use every tool that you can use? Um, and I love this shot too. She's just so present. Um, this is an old buddy of mine and his partner. I believe everybody should be able to love who they want to love. And uh, this was just a great moment. We were shooting and they both, for me, dropped in. They've been together over 20 years and I think that's wonderful. So another kid who was not too into doing the whole, we were doing a session. So I went up to him at the end, of, towards the end, and I said, listen, and trying to connect, I said, I know you're not having fun doing this. I'm going to ask you a favor for two minutes. Lean back here. However you're feeling, don't put anything on it. Just look at me and look at the lens. You don't have to do anything. Uh, and this is what I got. I'm very happy. That was the for me shot. Um, this is uh, one of my training clients who is a wonderful lady. She's uh, 87 or 88 and just caught a nice moment. This is a 50 millimeter lens. Uh, this is a natural window light. Managed to catch her in a pensive moment, which is not easy to do. Uh, this is a young, amazing actress. There's no makeup and I didn't do any work on her skin on this. Uh, this is that light coming in uh, under the Bethesda Terrace. Uh, there's no reflector, no flash. Uh, the catch light is coming from behind and just positioning her enough so it's relatively dark around her. Uh, this is my buddy Jordan Lage, fabulous actor, also in another area of Bethesda, uh, Bethesda Terrace. I wanted to go dark, completely dark behind him, processed in black and white for effect. Uh, this is a young uh, singer-songwriter named uh, Tucker Kaplow. This is in 72nd Street. I love scaffolding, right? And you get the light that's coming in diffuse from one side of it. So you have your uh, person facing out into the light that's coming in. Um, okay, and this is on the High Line. Uh, and this was B&H, learning how to use off-camera flash wirelessly. That's a 15-inch impact softbox. You can get it here at B&H. Uh, and one-handing the camera. Uh, earlier in that, we had friends holding it and stuff like that. But, and these are agreeable strangers. Um, so the ambient light, which was coming from uh, the billboard and them. And I love particularly the look on his face here. Um, and this is a writer who's got his first novel coming out uh, in about three weeks, named Cleve Lamison. And this is high speed sync uh, flash to overpower the sun. I still overexpose the background a little bit too much, but I'm very, very happy with the results of this. Filling in, this is going back and forth when the light changes. It was totally safe, folks. <laughs> um, this is an iPhone photo from the train of five points. I got very lucky, very sad that it got painted over. This exists no more. This is, if anybody wants to see at the end, this is an iPhone shot that I have blown up 15 by 20 on metal, if anybody wants to see. And I'm just going to go through. These are iPhone because I'm probably out of time. And this is all about catching moments, working people, morning commute. Hi, I love these ladies. <laughs> very early morning at Columbus Circle. So I'm not looking for reality in these shots. Uh, I'm looking for a certain feel and a whimsicality, uh, working, this whole series of people working and invisible. 
that's my dad uh, that was in July after a day at the hospital. Uh, and you know, the highlights are blown and all that. It's with the iPhone, but I had the phone and I cherished the photo. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very photogenic guy that was on a walk with B&H last uh, fall or summer, or I forget when it was. So. <laughs> so this is a guy on Sunday morning working, he's dragging his cart, you know, invisible. Uh, this is Chelsea Market on a Sunday at 9.13, so it's kind of quiet. Uh, there's a father and a uh, daughter in a pink dress, uh, and printed on metal, that dress pops, it's really amazing. I am not beyond doing cheesy things like this because I really kind of believe it, you know. Um, everybody's felt like this at the morning commute at some point. This is very evocative for me. I love this couple. Uh, this is just all about the movement and it's oversaturated. That's a filter on the phone that I like. Uh, this was taken, it was a full moon on the way home one night from the holiday market I had done in December. Uh, this was a photo I took the last day that I saw my father. Um, he passed away December 29th, so it's very meaningful to me. This is two iPhone photos, horizontal images that I brought into Photoshop. I merged them, processed in Lightroom, um, and I like the fact that it's kind of unfinished like that, uh, but evocative for me. Um, and this, I think, is the last one, shooting into the sun with the phone during the day and picking the right filter. That's it. Forget Miley Cyrus, we got Gene Lowinger. Uh, but Gene had uh, created a body of work and documented the vanishing Lower East Side, which if you're familiar with New York City neighborhoods, the Lower East Side was a very important neighborhood uh, during the times when New York City was getting filled with immigrants. And in particular, a lot of the, the Jewish immigrants that came in, uh, Lower East Side, I guess, was shared between Italians and, and Jews probably right at the turn of the century. Uh, but it was a bastion of, uh, of New York Jewish culture. And a lot of that moved out to Brooklyn, but there's still a residual amount of it if you take your lens and you really investigate it properly, just the same way that Gene did. Just a, 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 quick, a quick intro. Um, all my photography that you're gonna see today and all that I shoot is always about people. Uh, I love landscape, I love birds, I, and I love to look at all kinds of photography. When I take a picture, it has to have a person in it. I, I, it doesn't, I just, it just doesn't resonate for me if there's not a person somehow moving through the image. Um, and uh, I come from uh, an old black and white darkroom tradition. My first camera was a Nikon 8008. When I went to my, took my first photography class, my instructor said, forget that, you need to go out and get an M4, a Leica M4 with a 35 millimeter lens and a light meter and go out and shoot. Uh, I spent about a week on the street with a light meter and I got so disgusted using it that I l had to learn how to shoot without it because it's such a pain in the butt you know, checking your light all the time. So I learned. Uh, and that was a great experience for me. I had a black and white darkroom for a long time. And I love working in a black and white darkroom. It was like, you know, I close the door and for six hours, there's no phone, there's no television, no up, no down. It's just me coughing my guts out because of the chemicals and, and, uh, and making beautiful images. Um, but uh, when I, once I went digital, as much as I loved working in the dark room, it was just so much easier to do digitally uh, that uh, I knew I wasn't ever going to work in a, in a wet dark room again. Uh, and I can do more digitally on a computer screen than I ever could in a dark room. I, just for me, when I tell my teacher that, he says, you can do more, but turn me loose in a wet dark room and I can, you know, uh, he probably can. But I found that working with the software that I work with, I use Lightroom for almost everything and I use some plugins with Nick software plugins, especially SilverFX Pro. I have such amazing control over contrast in every inch of, an, of a frame. Uh, that it just I can I can do wonderful things with it. Um, some of the pictures you're going to see uh, were shot in my film days, and some of them uh, they were shot with the 8008 or the Leica M uh, M6 
at the time when I took the pictures. And um, the digital photography is, most of it is taken with the Fuji X-Pro1 and a variety of lenses. Uh, some of it was with my D700, which I gave up using because every time I went out shooting with it, when I came home, my legs were two inches shorter. Uh, because, you know, from walking around like this, by the end of the day, you could die. And I'm, I'm an old guy, so I, I don't need that anymore in my life. Let's go ahead with the photographs. They're all black and white. Some are over-processed, processing that I would never do anymore. But um, anyway, so the first nine photographs are just my general street photography. When I take photographs on the street, I have agendas in my mind. Uh, I have series of photographs that I take, and they're always in my mind when I'm walking around the street. And if I see, like, I see, I love to take pictures of people smoking or women or men with tattoos, people with hats, men, women in furs, couples interacting. Uh, so uh, those, those were always in my mind. Uh, I do a lot of street photography. Um, and as uh, David said, I have this one major project that I've been working on for about 20 years. I started in my film days, and I'll talk about it when we get there. But it's on the Lower East Side. So anyway, this. I like that one much better. Um, I, I was just, this was a hip shot um, from my D7, D700. Um, I did a lot of that kind of stuff with the D700, just carry the camera in front of me and click when I saw the image. And I, I did a lot of work intuitively um, and I don't do a lot of cropping. And when I show the work to my teacher, he says, you really nailed it on this shot. I know this wasn't a hip shot, right? And I go, right, it wasn't a hip shot. Because if I tell him it was a hip shot, I'm going to hear for a half hour about how I shouldn't shoot from the hip. So uh, he's, he's, Gary Winogrand never shot from the hip. Well, OK, fine. This was, this was the hip shot. I like the angle that it's on. It gives it a kind of dynamic feel to it. And it fits in to my, uh, what, uh, my subjects of a woman wearing that floppy hat and the sunglasses and the fur trim. It's on Fifth Avenue. Uh, let's see. OK. This was taken in, <laughs> in Times Square. Uh, and it was on, uh, it was on Halloween. Uh, it was t also taken with my D700. And I was walking by. And I was really interested in that skull with the cigarette sticking out of it. Uh, you know, I don't know if you can see this, the cigarette there. Uh, that, that was the subject of the picture. And uh, I took about five pictures, one right after the other, bing, 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 bing. And this beautiful young lady just happened to walk right into it and look, look at me when the camera was down here. So that's why she's not looking in the camera. But uh, the skull looking to the side and the woman looking at me with the cigarette just made the whole thing come together for me. Ah, uh, this uh, gentleman was on Madison Avenue. I love to walk on Madison Avenue from 86th Street down to 57th Street. There's so many beautiful clothing stores and restaurants there and so many beautiful people walking around in the street. And if you ever walk there and see the people walking in the street, if they go out to go to the supermarket to pick something up, uh, they, they have to wear their, uh, their best gowns and their uh, Jimmy Choo shoes. And uh, so I was taking pictures of all those people. And this guy walked by with this fuzzy hat, sunglasses, this scowl on his face. And he just, I just happened to catch it just at the moment when he walked past this window with Tony Bennett smiling. And it, that just made the picture for me. Ah, Every picture I take is not always absolutely in focus because uh, things happen really fast. This was taken on Canal Street uh, with, with the Fuji. And um, I saw this guy who was just, just such a typical Canal Street Bowery tough guy walking down the street. And he got to the window with the, statue, the, the Chinese statue there. And I took about four shots. And this one particular one was almost, if I could have gotten his lower body here just under the statue, 
it would have been perfect. But this one was the closest one. The, the shot before, his body was here, and the shot after, his body was here. So I, I was happy with this one. And he was looking at me, and he said, what are you taking my picture for? I get that a lot. Uh, <laughs> and, I just, and I just keep walking. I just keep unless I can charm the person, uh, and, and that does happen. <laughs> But in this particular case, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to, uh, to, to charm him. So <laughs> I just kept walking. Uh, ah, um, I love to take pictures of, of people smoking cigars, guys smoking cigars, or women too, but there's not that many of them. But this was taken on Washington Street uh, near the entrance to the High Line in 13th Street. There's a bar there called um, the Hagen Heifer, it's a real old style biker's bar. And during, when the weather's nice, and late in the afternoon, early evening, uh, on the weekends, all these bikers congregate there. Uh, and I hang out there on the bench, and this guy was out walking his dogs, and he sat down there, and he was smoking a cigar. I started talking to him about cigars, and these dogs were sitting there like, you took us out for a walk. Why aren't we walking? You know, so uh, I, I love the dogs too. This was taken in Washington, D.C. I was down visiting my nieces and I was walking around in downtown D.C. one day and it was a very cold day last March. Um, and I walked past, I wanted to get a picture of this homeless guy and I was trying to walk past him so I could get a good, good angle on him. And it just, I got to this spot and I saw the window there with this guy inside this fancy restaurant sitting there eating and this homeless guy outside and it was a perfect counterpoint. This, this is, a, it's a small project, it's, uh, it's a semi-project I'd like to call it, uh, of work that I'm doing on the intersection of 59th Street and 5th Avenue where the Apple store is. I find if I hang out there for an afternoon, everybody or every type of person in the world walks by. Uh, what I especially like is to get the counterpoint, the juxtaposition of the East Side ladies uh, doing lunch and all the other people at the same time. Now I've seen these two women countless times walking out there uh, and uh, I think they're sisters and they both went to the same plastic surgeon for the same fo face job, <laughs> nose job and lip job, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, and well, they look the same, don't they? I mean, they look like they went to the same plastic surgeon, but it covered everything. It was uh, couples, two women, and they're wearing furs and sunglasses and, um, I, the, the, and the Chinese girl in the background just made the whole image for me. And of course, I will tell you, since my teacher isn't here, I did not see the girl in the middle when I took the picture. When I showed it to him, he says, man, you nailed it with that Chinese girl in the center. And I said, yes, I know I did, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell him because every time I say no, it's a half hour lecture. You know, so anyway, okay. This shot is like, uh, I mean, when I got this shot, I got home and I looked at it on the computer and I just said, yes! And I danced for about a half hour when I got it because this was on the Bowery. I just turned a corner from Canal Street and was walking up the street and these two people were walking towards me and she was going, and he's going, <sighs> like I, he was just about ready to strangle her at this point. Uh, and I just love the expression on his face. So anyway, I think there's one more picture of, of just my street stuff, which is, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, this isn't uh, a classic shot. I don't know what is. Uh, this was on, on a marble wall outside the Apple Store, 59th and 5th Avenue. And these, uh, these two kids were eating ice cream. And their parents were there. And I was, uh, you know, they were taking pictures of the two kids. And I walked right between the two parents. And I kneeled down. And, and obviously, the girl that's on the right didn't want me to take her picture, which actually makes the picture for me um, and I, it's one of my favorite favorite shots I sent it to the parents and they thanked me for sending it to them and they thought it was a beautiful picture and so 
Okay, now, the, uh, the next shot, I think the next one, yes, this is the beginning of my l series on the Lower East Side. When I, I used to work for a Wall Street bank. I was a systems analyst for about 10 years until I practically lost my mind working there. I was a musician for many years before that, um, and I decided at one point that I was tired of hustling all the time to make a living, and I really wanted a straight job. So I studied uh, computers, and I got this job working at a Wall Street bank. It was the only straight job I've ever had in my life, and um, for 10 years, um, uh, from doing that job for 10 years, I had, I hit, I literally hit, my bottom. Uh, the bank uh, downsized me, which was the greatest blessing in the world for me that they, that they fired me. The day I got fired, I went up to the new school where I studied with my teacher and I said, I just got fired today. And I wanted some sympathy from him. Uh, so he said to me, great, let's go out and shoot, you know. Uh, <laughs> And from that day on, I consider my, that was the beginning of my photography career. He took me under his wing and I would, he would call me whenever he shot for Associated Press and said, say, meet me at the courthouse, I'm going down to take pictures of Woody Allen. And he would say, stand over there in case he comes out that door. And I would, he would stand, and he worked with me like that for quite a few years. Um, he encouraged me to do my own personal projects, which is what this is part of. I was very depressed one day and I was just out walking around after being down in the financial district and I was walking around the Lower East Side and I walked past on Rivington Street, this synagogue. It's the first Romanian American congregation. It's a historic building. It's a historic congregation. I remember when I was a little boy, my father playing recordings of Metropolitan opera stars, Jan Pierce and Richard Tucker, who when they first emigrated to the United States, worked as cantors in that synagogue before they went on to the Metropolitan Opera. Um, and I saw the building and I'm looking at it, I said, this is the place my father always told me about. And while I was standing there, oh, sorry, uh, when I was standing there, this gentleman here, is uh, Rabbi Jacob Spiegel. He was, he was the rabbi of the synagogue and the owner of the building at the time. And he walked up to me and said, can I help you with something? Because you know, I, I had a big bushy beard and I had a ponytail and I was seedy looking, you know. Uh, and so I told him that I remember the synagogue. My, I told him the story I just told you. And he said, um, he said, well, do you want to come inside? We're going to start services in about 10 minutes. You know, he, re he really wanted to, uh, to get me to come in to be part of the service. How he knew I was Jewish, I don't know. Uh, I don't look Jewish, I know. But um, anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, so I said to him, can I take pictures? He stood there for a minute. <laughs> and he knew that I, he said yes. Because I think he knew that if he said no, that I wasn't going to go inside. You know. So the only way he got me inside was to say yes. So I went inside, and from that day on, the project was born. And what you're going to see now is all from, from that whole project. The first set of pictures, I broke it down into sacred and secular. The sacred pictures will all have to do with the synagogue and this synagogue and another one or the rabbis and the secular is some street photography on the Lower East Side. So this was Rabbi Spiegel outside the First Romanian Congregation which is covered in graffiti. The synagogue is no longer there. It collapsed and it's an empty lot now. Uh, it was a beautiful old building at the time. This is Rabbi Spiegel talking to, this is off, uh, sorry, uh, this, is, this officer here is George Sanchez. When I showed Rabbi Spiegel's son this picture, he immediately said, that's Officer Sanchez. You have to give him a copy of this picture. This is 20 years later. Uh, so we made a copy of the picture. He walked me over. Ra uh, officer Sanchez is now retiring from the police force this March, but he's been the community affairs director for the precinct for the past 10 years. Um, 
And he was thrilled to get the picture. So, okay. Uh, now, this is inside the synagogue. This person here, is his name is Aaron Halberstam. Uh, I think he's still serving time in Sing Sing. Uh, <laughs> true, true. Uh, he was... Uh, uh, he was caught red-handed in some major embezzlement. Uh, and, but, I mean, the look on his face, and when I look at it, it just is, Rabbi Spiegel's son, when he saw the picture, he said, oh, that's Aaron Halberstam. Yeah, he's, he's in Sing Sing. And, you know, he looks like, uh, in Yiddish, it's a, it is a word called ganef, which means, uh, <laughs> I, I can't translate it. That doesn't mean, it means tough guy, but it means more than tough guy. Um, anyway, uh, the person behind him is Dave, um, I don't remember everybody's name. Uh, he, the, this, gen this gentleman here is, was the local barber, and f he cut everybody's hair on the Lower East Side, and he was always telling me, you know, because I had a ponytail, he says, come in sometime, come in. <laughs> <laughs> and in the background is a very young Rabbi Shmuel Spiegel, the rabbi's son, who I have later connected with, and uh, I'm working with now to do pictures uh, 20 years later on the Lower East Side. So we'll see some of those in the course of this presentation. That's the basement of the synagogue where all the services were held. The upstairs, the main sanctuary, was in total disrepair, and it was, it was not serviceable. Um, and uh, the reason I wanted to get this picture was because, of course, the three of them in a line, but this right here, that's, uh, I forgot what the, yeah, what the Jewish word for it is, but it's a, it's a, a, a tzedakah in, in Hebrew means uh, righteousness, it's charity. And when you go to services, you put a dollar in the box. They don't pass the tray at all, you just, you put, and if you don't put a dollar or a coin in there, and the rabbi is always watching out of the side of his eye, and he goes, <laughs> you know, so that's, that's why I, I took the picture, because of the, of the line like that. Uh, yeah. This is uh, taken on uh, uh, a day or two before the, well, it's during the time of the Sukkot festival when uh, congregants march around with these uh, palm leaves in their hands. Um, this, this person is, uh, is Rabbi Moshe Singer. He was, at the time, he was about 85 years old. Uh, this is Rabbi Spiegel's oldest son, Gershon Spiegel. Moshe, Spiegel uh, Moshe Singer was a, one of the main rabbis in the Lower East Side during the, uh, you know, in the 50s and the 60s. He was considered to be one of the special rabbis that everybody thought had a direct connection. Just to stand next to him was a spiritual experience. You could just feel it radiating off of him. Um, ah. Now, this is a picture reading the Torah uh, one day. This is uh, the, another one of Rabbi Spiegel's sons. This is uh, Shmuel Spiegel, the person we saw before. And this young person here is a grandchild of Rabbi Jacob Spiegel. And I said to Rabbi Spiegel one day, I thought you're not supposed to have women in the sanctuary during services. And he said, where? And I, I pointed to, he said, that's my grandson. The tradition is that they don't cut their hair until they're three years old. So, and I really thought it was his granddaughter, but um, what did I know? Anyway, so here they are reading the Torah. The day that they did this service, when, and the tradition is when you read the Torah, there's a, a certain, order of people that come up to the Torah. This is Israel Kallenberg, this gentleman here. He is what we call a Kohen. He's the first person that gets called to the Torah. And they have to be done in a certain order. So he finished after I took this picture. Um, and then the next person was called up was supposed to be from the tribe of Levi. The person who was normally a Levi was not there. And they couldn't go any further in the service. because the, So the rabbi said, is there anybody here that's a Levite? So I just went like this. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you? 
the photographer he says you can do this <laughs> and I said I was born Mitzvah of course I can do it so he said come here my boy you know he put a talus over me and he stood over me while I said the, the blessings about 10 different people in the congregation I had my Leica M6 with me at that day and they were all grabbing the camera, trying to take a picture of the photographer reading the Torah, and nobody could figure out how to work the damn camera. So I never got a picture of it. But uh, so the next picture you see is 20 years later, and you'll see why I took the picture. It's, you know, the same, the same picture to me. 20 years later, the tradition is timeless. The look of the people is timeless. This picture was taken in the Sons, Rabbi Shmuel Spiegel Synagogue, which is on East Broadway. And um, it, just, it just speaks to me about the whole timelessness of, of the thousands of years of tradition that is still going on, however much diminished on the Lower East Side today. Uh, ah. This, this gentleman is um, Henry Reininger. He's an attorney. And it, this picture was taken during the Perm Festival and he's reading a special book that's called uh, uh, A Megillah. And it's the story of Esther. And I just, you know, I turned around and I saw him with his hat pulled over his eyes and the book up covering most of his face and his eyes intensely reading the book and got the picture. And I love the picture, I love the hat. And the reason I love the hat is because 20 years later I found him. He has a law practice on Avenue A. I found him and I went in to take, uh, to take pictures of him. And so I got it, but that's not the same hat. When I was taking pictures of him, he said, you want me to use that same hat? I have it back here. And his wife said, don't you wear that terrible hat in the picture. It's a terrible hat you can't wear. So he said, what can I do? I can't wear the hat, you know, so. But I wanted to get a picture of him 20 years later. Um, and he was telling me about his favorite actor, John Wayne. And the two of them together wearing hats just made the picture for me. This is that same holiday that I took pictures of 20 years ago where you saw Rabbi Singer holding the uh, lulav. The, the palm uh, in, the, in the synagogue uh, this past autumn. And this is Rabbi Shmuel Spiegel blowing the chauffeur. And if you can see this young lady back here is the rabbi's daughter. Uh, and um, it's just, uh, the whole picture is just, I have about 20 pictures of him from different angles blowing the chauffeur. And um, it just came together for me because uh, the, his daughter in the background and the, and the gentleman on, on the right side. Uh, so let's see what, ah, uh, is Rabbi Spiegel again uh, giving a sermon uh, on during the Hanukkah festival. And I got the high sign, so we got to move a little bit. Uh, I was invited by Rabbi Spiegel to attend a very special ceremony on the Lower East Side, a couple of very um, important people in the community had twin boys. And it was, uh, they invited me to come to the Bris to take pictures in the synagogue of the Bris. So I took lots and lots of pictures. Uh, this is um, uh, the, uh, the godfather or the, uh, the brother, uh, the uncle of the baby carrying the baby uh, up to the, uh, to the bima. And uh, you can see, this is the father here, that's the baby. This rabbi, his name is uh, David Feinstein, uh, and he's considered to be the greatest scholar, Talmud scholar in the world today. Uh, and, um, Everybody, he's like the Grand Poobah of the Lower East Side. Everybody was, wanted their picture taken with him. And uh, it, was, it was quite an impressive ceremony. I, I, I really cherished the opportunity to be invited to, to take pictures at such, a, such a, an intimate uh, ceremony. Ah, 
this picture was taken on, Char on a synagogue on Charles Street. Now, the reason I took it, this gentleman, um, Herbert, Herman Lowenhart, was a part of the original congregation uh, on the Lower East Side, and uh, he now is president of the synagogue on Charles Street in the village. I went to visit him, and he told me when they were renovating the synagogue, they pulled up some floorboards and they found this newspaper there. I don't know if you can read what it what this says. It says, U.S. must win war, Pershing declared. Well, that's World War I. You know, and uh, if you can read the date right here, I don't know if you can read it on the paper, but I, it's August 1917. And he found it like that, and I, uh, I just thought it was so incredible that they found a newspaper crumpled up under the floorboards in the synagogue from 1917. Ah, this is the street photography now uh, from the Lower East Side. There's a very famous stairway on Essex Street. It's a curved stairway. Um, and I was taking pictures of it and some guy walked by with uh, five children. Uh, and he said, take a picture of my children. So I, put, I, I posed them on the stairway, and I love this particular one because of this kid here picking his nose. Uh, I just, you know, I, it's just a, such a childish thing to do. And um, this is um, a kid on an on a amusement park ride, and this was taken in Williamsburg. Um, and for, for circus, they have a big street fair, tremendous number of rides, and you know, kids are kids, doesn't matter if they're Hasidic kids or whatever, and um, they, they were just having a good time. So I just love the picture of this kid with the, the uh, side curls uh, on the ride. Um, this is a street fair in Lower East Side, uh, of a woman that I know that works down there walking by and she found, I'm always joking, making uh, funny innuendos with her because she, we, we flirt a lot. And um, she walked past this, these boxes of ram's horns and she held up these ram's horns for me and I just thought, well, it was a very telling picture, you know. <laughs> uh, this is uh, in Williamsburg also of, of two. These, these people, they have to examine every piece of palm in these stems that they have to make sure that they're absolutely perfect. If they're not perfect, they can't be used in the service. So that they, they, they look at every single, every single um, uh, stalk of palm leaves. This is uh, Rabbi Aaron um, Lichter. Uh, he's a Torah scribe. This picture was taken 20 years ago on, in a shop on Essex Street. I found him not too long ago. He's still on a Lower East Side in a different location, and I took more pictures of him. This is him 20 years later. I just love all the junk in the background more than anything else in the picture. I was fascinated by it. His, his, the first shop was just, as, just like this, too. I mean, it's, he's a pack rat. Um, this is uh, Sholem Halpert, he's a bookbinder, Henry Street bookbinding on Henry Street 20 years ago. Uh, and when I went back to the community, the bookbinder was still there. I knocked on his door, I showed him the pictures. He said, no, that's not me. And I said, yes, it is, Sholem, it's you. And he looked at it and he says, oh my God, I can't believe I was so handsome. Yeah, um, <laughs> And so I, I go to visit him all the time, and I bring him pictures all the time, and this is Sholem Halper today. Uh, he's a remarkable person. Uh, if you get, to get to know him, it's quite, quite an experience. This is a shoe shop uh, on Grand Street, and it was like, it, it, the whole Jewish community down on the Lower East Side is not all Orthodox Jews. There, were, there was a very strong element of these uh, 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 socialists that, that lived down there. And uh, Itzhak, that's this gentleman, oh, sorry, this gentleman here is the, is the shoemaker. Um, he didn't care at all about religion. He wanted, he just, uh, he was he's not a communist. He was a just old world socialist. And they, they used to have meetings in his store. 
and they would all talk about articles in the Jewish Daily Forward newspaper. Um, and these are two guys. This is that's Itzhak and his friend who worked for him in the shoe store. All these are both old pictures. The shoe store is still there. Itzhak is long since gone. Two old ladies on Orchard Street 20 years ago, and two ladies in Crown and uh, in Williamsburg. Now, uh, the two pictures just seem to be so similar to me. Uh, this gentleman is Max Davidowitz. He's a Holocaust survivor. You can see in the picture he's showing me his tattoo. And the stories he told me were just, he made, I was crying by the time I got done with the conversation with him. I don't have a lot of time though, I can't go into the stories now, but they were pretty tragic. This is in the basement of a kosher butcher shop, and the guy is making potato latkes. Um, uh, Rafael uh, Estevez is his name, but he's an Orthodox Jew. Uh, and when he got done making them, uh, I took a lot of pictures of him, and then he said, you want, you want? He gave me a big container. Best potato latkes I've had in a long time. Boy, were they greasy. Oh, I loved them. <laughs> uh, this was just taken on Grant Street at a delicatessen. Uh, just, I love the picture with the old guy and the young kid with the, with the skull cap on his head. Very typical scene on the Lower East Side. It's the same today as it was then. The reason I love this picture is because <laughs> of this lady here. That's a, a plastic bag she's wearing on her head. <laughs> It's functional, you know. <laughs> I also happen to like it because, because of this body position here. Uh, uh, anyway, all right. And this is just an old gentleman on Essex Street saying goodbye, and that's it. Okay, for our next presenter and next photographer, we have John Skelson. And uh, John is... Uh, John's particular because John got in one of the best blogs ever, the New York Times Lens Blog. Do you guys read the New York Times Lens Blog? Yeah, it's just like it's, you know, my, my wife was ripping apart. She was comparing fashion blogs to photography blogs. And she goes, who reads them? They're not important. I said, well, actually, no, photography blogs are kind of great. I mean, it's a good way of seeing new work. And, and the New York Times Lens Blog is wonderful. So the, the uh, Lens Blog, I did a profile on John. And, uh, and we noticed it, of course, and we're just so honored uh, that uh, such an August place like the New York Times was going to uh, show his work. And this is, again, this is a, a long-term project type work. So longtime Staten Island native, John Skelson, nothing passes by Staten Island without John capturing it in his viewfinder. Currently, I work with a Nikon D600 and a 28 to 300 millimeter lens to capture my waterfront photography, which is what you're going to see here today. I teach photography on Staten Island at the Art Lab, which is Staten Island's answer to the Art Students League, although it's a little bit smaller. Um, and uh, I'll just move along here. Uh, of course, I was in the, I had the article in the New York Times. I'm also a fire buff. Uh, right out chasing fire engines all the time. In that, 1993, I did a net photo essay at the first bombing of the World Trade Center, which was exhibited at the Fire Museum for about six months. So, I'll just start off here. Uh, typical Moran tugboat, Cape Cod. Uh, Moran, Moran Towing is uh, one of the oldest uh, companies operating in New York Harbor right now. New York. Uh, uh, McAllister is the second oldest, I would guess. They've been around forever. They're red tugboats. This is a container ship, two Moran tugboats holding it. Uh, all of, everything that you could imagine comes in on these containers uh, into, into New York Harbor. Drugs? Huh? Drugs too, I'm sure. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, I had my students out once uh, photographing the ships on the waterfront, and uh, later on that night, the ship that we were photographing was there, there was six stowaways that jumped over. Uh, they, I think they found one of them. I said the rest of them were probably sitting in a bar in Bayonne. But uh, everybody was excited. We all photographed the ship. And 
There you can see uh, this is uh, Port Elizabeth, New Jersey, where everything is offloaded. Uh, Costco Nagoya. Costco is a China Ocean Shipping Company. These ships come in loaded, uh, and within a matter of 16 hours, they're back out to sea. The United States doesn't really uh, export anything, so they'll go out with containers loaded with scrap metal, uh, recyclable paper, and what have you. Patrice McAllister. This is taken from my usual Staten Island spot. <laughs> it's a replica of Henry Hudson's Half Moon, uh, which can be found here and there around the Hudson River. Uh, up, uh, I believe they maybe uh, have a port up in Yonkers, but this was out uh, in, the, in the Upper Bay off of uh, <coughs> Brooklyn uh, this past summer. The pilot. Sandy Hook Pilots Association. You can't, the captain of the ship cannot bring a ship into port. They have to put a pilot on board. And here you can see a pilot coming down the gangway. They have to bring a ship in. Grandma Lee T. Moran, the tugboat alongside. Anybody who owns a big tugboat company has to have a large family to name all their tugboats. <laughs> <laughs> as a close-up ship of the pilot coming down the ladder. Now, this is in the harbor, in the Kilvane Colors, the waterway separating Staten Island from uh, Bayonne, New Jersey, connecting the upper bay of uh, New York and Newark Bay. It's uh, about three miles long, a thousand feet wide, and uh, is very important <coughs> to the commerce of this country. So much passes through there. One of the newer looking tugs, actually this tug just came into service when I took it, the Rheinauer Twins. Rheinauer handles a lot of uh, oil transportation up and down the East Coast. Another odd looking tugboat, I think they call it the high rise tug. But uh, just so many different uh, This is a uh, tug moving a dredge around where the dredging is going on in New York Harbor to make it deeper to handle bigger ships. Uh, nice color, but I do use Lightroom to uh, pop my color out a little more. I don't use Photoshop very much. Lightroom is 90% of my uh, processing. I always shoot in RAW. And I do use the NIC and On One software occasionally. But 99% of what I do is all done in Lightroom. I may uh, pick up the red saturation or the blue saturation at one point just to, just to pop some color. And his mud being dredged out of the harbor. <coughs> if you've ever seen this, uh, in Bayonne, New Jersey, they've built a uh, world-class uh, golf course. And it was built from mud that was dredged out of the harbor. There's more of the dredging operation. This is rock salt being delivered. This is Atlantic Salt Company in Staten Island. Uh, I had uh, an opportunity to get on uh, the site uh, when they were unloading the ship. It brought, I don't know how many hundreds of tons of rock salt. Not enough. Not enough. And <laughs> actually, no. in the last three weeks, there's been four ships unloading, including this one. This ship runs, it's bringing rock salt from Chile. And uh, after spending about a half an hour from there, I could taste salt for a week. I had to go home and brush the cameras off. They had just had a layer of salt on them. Yeah. Well, salt on that camera is scary. Yeah. John B. Cadell, the ship that washed ashore during Sandy. It was a harbor tanker for years. It was built in 1940 and ran New York Harbor up until about uh, 2010, 2011, something. When it was sold to uh, gentleman from Africa who was going to transport it over and use it as a uh, river tanker. They had uh, they have less restrictions on uh, the shipping over there. Unfortunately, uh, it was tied up on Staten Island Sandy. It broke loose from its moorings and washed ashore. Uh, the city was trying to find out where the owner was to have it removed, and there was no sign of him. And the story goes that this person uh, connected with the Somali pirates and was murdered. 
So the city had it uh, removed and towed to a scrapyard uh, where it's still sitting right now waiting to be cut up. This is John B. Cadell during its working days. And this is where it sits on the Rossville section of Staten Island in uh, Woody's scrapyard, the graveyard, uh, where there's been a lot of history. This is uh, an old Navy rescue tug from World War II. It's also sitting in Whitty's yard. Actually, you can get out. Uh, you can't go into the yard to photograph, but there are places along the roadway where you can get in and get these photos. This tug uh, actually rescued a ship off of uh, Maine that was torpedoed by a U-boat and uh, was able to save the ship and uh, all the crew members. It was later sold to uh, a, co a company in Florida, and after its useful service, it came to Staten Island where it's rotting away. This is another former Navy tug that actually uh, served in the D-Day uh, invasion. And uh, then it was later sold to the Pennsylvania Railroad. And here it sits again, just wasting away. Seawolf Point, the ferry boat that ran from the Bronx and to Rocket, Rikers Island up until 1966. This is what's left of it. Unfortunately, Sandy destroyed a lot of uh, what was there, the wooden hulk. So uh, up to a few years ago, there was quite a bit more to see. These were all, these last three photos, four photos were taken in the last, uh, in the last few months. <coughs> Getting out on a boat uh, is not as easy as it once was, but uh, we ha we're fortunate in New York <coughs> Harbor, we have the Working Harbor Committee runs boat rides. Uh, <coughs> and uh, they usually run out of South Street Seaport and they'll come up into the Kilvan Cull or East River. Yeah, it's not like taking the circle line. You're going to go into the gritty part of New York Harbor where you don't normally see. Uh, they run trips from May through September. It's a great <coughs> opportunity, a great platform for doing photography. <coughs> June K uh, was operated by Cosnac up until 10, uh, 2010, 2011 when they went out of business. They were, had a whole fleet of orange tugboats, which were really neat. But the company goes out of business, and this is June K today, it's now the Sarah Ann. But if you look close on the bow, you can still see the name June K. And see the World Trade Center in the background. Joyce D. Brown. Not many green tugboats around anymore. Uh, Joyce D. Brown was originally to John P. Brown. Uh, his wife, Joyce, passed away in a fire and he renamed the tugboat in her honor. This is an old uh, tramp steamer. This is before container ridges from an old Kodachrome slide. It was heading for the Brooklyn waterfront where longshoremen unloaded the ships. Uh, all the uh, stores were on uh, pallets, like what you would have seen in the movie On the Waterfront. This is container ridge. This is how everything comes in today, and if you saw Captain Phillips, you know, Marisk Line. And this ship actually, I think, is larger than the one that was in, the, in that incident, the Alabama. This is the uh, Marisk Idaho. This is a car carrier, also known as a row row. Uh, row row it has a ramp on the stern of the ship where they can drive the cars on and off, so they call it roll on, roll off, or row row. These ships come in uh, every other day, there's one or two ships coming in with new cars. Chili and reefer make you think about what they're bringing in. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, essentially, it was the banana boat. And the orange sky. Anybody want to guess what they bring in? Orange juice. All your, unless it said it's. it's uh, Pure Florida orange juice, it comes from uh, some other country on a tanker into Port Newark where it's processed. Blue Marlin. Blue Marlin spent over a month in New York Harbor. Uh, it's what's called a heavy lift ship. Uh, it was best known for uh, the uh, USS Cole when it was bombed in the Persian Gulf. Uh, 
Blue Marlin went in and was able to lift the, uh, the ship out of the water and sail it back to Norfolk to the shipyard, the USS Cole. And what they do, it actually the whole deck of it uh, submerges and they can move ships onto it. It was here to uh, load up old tugboats and barges that were sold to uh, Nigeria. And here you can see some of the tugboats on the deck. At the time there was some pretty bad weather conditions with fog and everything, so I never did get uh, the shot of it fully loaded. Queen Mary in Red Hook. And this was taken from one of the water taxis. It's nice to get a, an up close and good light. And a Norwegian uh, breakaway sailing on her maiden voyage to Bermuda last uh, May or June, whatever it was. And it's a couple of Moran tugboats docking a tanker. Uh, in the Kill Van Cull. And another petroleum tanker in Bayway, New Jersey, just offloaded. Little Bear, he write kids' books about that tugboat. It's a little tiny red tugboat. This is a view from the Bayonne Bridge. Unfortunately, we can't go up on the Bayonne Bridge any longer because it's being raised. Uh, but it was great to, instead of having to pay for a helicopter, you'd have the ships passing underneath you on a walkway. Um, I think we have to wait about three years for them to put in the new uh, walkway and open the bridge up. But that's going to be a really unique project to watch. They're going to raise the bridge uh, from 165 to 200 and 10, 215 feet so we can handle the bigger ships coming into Newark. Left Coast, left coast Lifter uh, left San Francisco on December 22nd of this year and sailed 6,000 miles to New York Harbor, came in uh, January 30th. It's going to be used on the new Tappan Zee Bridge project. Uh, it's tied up in Bayonne, New Jersey right now, waiting, uh, being refitted to go up there. And uh, any day soon now, we'll be able to get shots of it coming up the Hudson River. <coughs> you see Tug Resolute waiting to pick up a pilot. That's one of the crew members. Uh, this ship handles scrap metal. It's heading in to load up with scrap metal and it'll take it to some kind of other country to be smelted. Another container ship coming in. It was a great sunset at that time. It was, we had a really nasty, cloudy, rainy day all day and I was sitting having some coffee at the kitchen table and I could see this glow of orange coming up in the west and I look and the sky was black in the <coughs> east. I said, I gotta go down and I know I'm gonna get some good shots out of it. One of the old Governor's Island ferry boats, the private Nicholas Manu, I believe he pronounced, uh, <laughs> pronounced his name. It's in the Kilvan Cull. It's been sitting just west of the Bayonne Bridge uh, <coughs> now for several years. Somebody painted on it, you go girl. So it's become the Yugo Girl Ferry. Another McAllister tug heading out to sea. Oh, we're already near the end. This is a sunset in Port Newark. And this was one of uh, was taken from one of the working harbor trips. And this was uh, Staten Island Ferry passing in front of the 9-11 lights. This, another great thing about digital photography is that you can handle in any, uh, just about any sort of light and be able to hold your camera. This was shot at ISO 6400. Uh, I believe I was using a Nikon 50 millimeter 1.4 lens and could never do this with film. Everybody, thank you very much. If you want to come up here and hang out, check out some stuff. But thanks a lot.
Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, BNH has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.